Okay, so um, what we're going to do now is um, s something more by way of a, a general introduction to and overview of the field. Um, so uh, if we can go to that first PowerPoint there briefly. Actually, you, you, when they say agenda, you don't necessarily need to write this one down, although you, you could. I mean, it tells you what we're going to do, right? So we're going to start with um, introductory considerations about ethics, and then we're going to go to these uh, key logical concepts that you tend to use in every philosophy course, concepts of arguments, validity, and soundness. Cool, yeah, so if we could switch back to, yeah, awesome, thank you. Okay, so before we start um, start the overview, I just want to uh, say one thing about terminology, right? That is, I'm going to use the terms ethics and morality and the terms ethical and moral interchangeably. For our purposes, they're going to mean the same thing. Um, I mean, they have... If you look at the etymology, they have sort of similar one Greek, one Latin root. But there are people who think that in English um, they have different connotations, right? I've heard it's suggested that um, oh, um, ethical violations have to do with money and moral violations have to do with sex. I mean, maybe that's right about the connotations in ordinary English, but that's not the way we're going to use them, right? For us, they're simply and straightforwardly interchangeable. All right, so what I'm going to do now to um, give you a flavor of the field is I'm just going to start with a list of ethical questions. There are going to be six of them. They're going to be chosen, I mean, not entirely random, but um, they're by no means entirely systematic, and they're certainly not exhaustive. There's certainly many, many ethical questions that aren't on this list. Right? And what I want to do is really just use them as a conversation starter. So specifically what I'm going to do is, once I've got the list out there and you've got it, I'm just going to ask you what you notice about them, either um, individually or together. All right, so if we could, well, here we are, go to the PowerPoint temporarily there. So the list of questions. This is one of those cool PowerPoints that goes, comes up bit by bit. I learned how to do this when I first... I've forgotten how to do it now, so I can't design any more slides like this one. Oh, it's cool. Oh, it's cool. All right, so first ethical question. What's a just society? Now, what features would a society have to have to be just? Second, is capital punishment ever morally permissible? Is it ever morally okay? Third, is morality all relative or are there moral absolutes? Fourth, a question famously associated with the 20th century moral philosopher W.D. Ross. What makes right actions right? What is it about a right action that makes it right? Okay, fifth one. Before I introduce you to it, I've I got to tell a little background story, right? So suppose it's like this. Suppose at some point after class today, I meet you in the parking lot, and I say to you, um, I've, I don't know, I've locked my keys out of my car, and I don't have any credit cards with me, and I've, I've called the guy who's going to come get the keys out, but I'm $10 short of the amount of money I need to 
pay the guy to unlock my car for me. So will you lend me $10? And you say, yeah, okay. And I say, okay, I'll, I'll pay you back you know, when I see you in class next. Right. So then the question is, ought I to repay the $10 I owe you? If, if the debt arose in, in that particular way. Okay, finally, is euthanasia ever morally permissible? Okay, you've got that, right? So Let's switch, but yeah, cool. Um, so, so now, let me ask you again, with the preface, it's not that there's some particular thing I'm expecting you to say here, right? But I'm trying to get some introductory thoughts and reactions out. So what do you notice about this list of questions? What, what strikes you about this list or the questions on it? Um. One of the things that I that I uh, one of the things that I kind of uh, noticed was uh, um, that uh, given the uh, um, question three and question one can be kind of related because mm -hmm. um, I find that a lot of people associate moral absolute uh, associate more of an absolute point of view from an individual perspective, but maybe a more relative view from a social perspective, perhaps. Um, interesting. I, I could be. I mean, cer I, I certainly agree that there are connections, right, between these questions. I mean, in particular, there seems like there's a connection between three and the others of, of, of this sort, that if the answer to three is morality is all relative, then that has a definite impact on whether it's possible to give an answer to most of the others, a, you know, correct answer, right? Um, the particular combination of views you have in mind, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But, I mean, so the idea was that the social stuff's relative and the individual stuff isn't? Uh, the way I kind of saw it was a lot of, uh, like, um, say, uh, if you look at it from maybe a perspective of, say, for abortion, mm -hmm. on a personal level, I wouldn't condone it, but maybe I don't feel that I have the right to interfere in anybody else's life, and that makes it relative on a social perspective. Hmm. Um, let's see. See, I, I mean, I, the, it is possible to have the view that... Um, uh, that abortion is wrong, but abortion should not be legally prohibited, right? Um, it seems to me that that view is not really a form of relativism, though, right? I mean, that's a view according to which there is a right answer, both to the question whether abortion is right or wrong, and to the question whether m abortion, you know, morally ought to be legally permissible or not, right? So I don't... Um, it's true that in that case um, you've got um, sort of a pair of convictions, the, um, the conviction about the rightness and the conviction about what the legal setup ought to be, that seem, uh, they're, a, they're a package that may seem to be in some tension, though they're prima facie consistent, but it doesn't seem to me that the right way to label the um, sort of uh, view about whether stuff should be legally permissible is as relativistic. Right. That's an interesting, interesting line of thought. Yeah. So, what else do people see, notice, think?
Go ahead. I mean, maybe this is just repeating what he was just saying, but uh, it kind of seems that a lot of these uh, questions are subjective and probably vary with uh, which, in, you know, different individuals, I suppose. Interesting, yeah. So you, you suggest that they're um, subjective and vary with different individuals. And that's certainly, a, I mean, it's an important sort of view to um, think about. Yeah, if we, if we can go back. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, so I want the PowerPoint in a sec, but no, just yet. Um, so, um, there's two things you might mean by saying they're subjective, right? And you've got to be sort of clear that these are different and there's a jump from one to the other, right? One is you might think that as a practical matter, people's views about them will be different, right? Another thing you might mean is, you know, there's no right answer and whatever anyone thinks is right is right for them. Notice that those are different views. It's perfectly possible for people to think that people's actual views dif differ about stuff without going on to infer from that that there's no correct answer, right? So that, that's an important further step. Um, second off, if we can now pop, up, pop back to the PowerPoint. Um, strikingly right, it's not true of all the questions on our list that there's going to be radical disagreement about them. Um, so consider question five, the question, ought I to repay the $10 I owe you? Um, if we can go to class shot here. Um, so let me take a poll. So how many people think that I ought to repay the $10 I owe you? Raise your hands. How many people think I ought not to? You really think I morally ought not to? Or you think it would just be better for me? You think, uh, uh, I believe if you were actually to pay back the $10, then the kindness that was invested into the action wouldn't actually be as worthwhile. Oh, I see. Yeah, but... Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, but, so, I wonder if, if I could... I um, uh, wonder if I could take care of that by specifying more about the setup. I mean, the setup was supposed to be that we made an agreement, right? I mean, you know, you handed me the tenor, and sure, I was very grateful, but I, you know, I said I promised to pay you back. Right? So, I mean, I see so, so your view, though. It's interesting. So it, it would be in virtue of the fact that it would be um, more morally worthy of you to lend me the money um, and for me not to pay it back, then that gets me out of it. Yeah. I mean, I'm skeptical about that as a view about, I mean, you know, I think you would be if you followed it through as a view about agreements in general. But it's interesting. interesting. But look, I mean, so we didn't, for this interesting reason, get quite unanimity there. We came very close, right? And one thing that's worth noticing and important to notice about um, people's views about moral issues is it's just not true that every moral issue is something that there's burning disagreement about and that, you know, people line up 50-50 on either side, right? I mean, it's not just... Um, that particular sample I gave you there, right? I mean, if I ask, you know, is slavery wrong? Yes, you all answer, right? Um, is torturing innocent children just for fun wrong? Yes, right? If OJ did what the prosecution said he did, was it wrong? Yes. Yeah? I mean, so it's, I mean, it's more interesting to talk about questions about which there's a bunch of disagreement, right? And there are a bunch of them. But that shouldn't blind you to the fact that there are also quite a lot of ethical questions. Right? I mean, I've probably indefinitely many of either kind, right? but there are lots of ethical questions about which there isn't a bunch of disagreement, about which everyone agrees. OK, so what else do people know? Don't hide, don't hide. This is your chance to be a TV star. Come on. Or a quick time start.
for like all these questions except for number three all tie into number four where it says what makes right actions right because they're all talking about what what's the right thing to do what determines what's right yeah good I, I mean I, th I think that's um, that's a sensible thing to think so that so there's um, there's a kind of um, structure or hierarchy or something right where um, some of the questions and in, I mean that's a good one to pick so, uh, are in a way more general and um, as you say tie into or in some way determine the answers to some in, in some way to the more specific ones yeah I think that's right and actually one of the things I want to do um, in a sec is uh, give you sort of one way of presenting or um, conceptualizing that that sort of hierarchy but yeah I mean I think you're quite right that there's something of that that sort to be found yeah. Yeah. good uh, for me like with these questions it like implies that you know for like the wrongdoing there's going to be some kind of penalty and and but they don't specify you know what's going to happen like if you don't do what everybody else thinks you should do um, so you say um, there's an imp there's an implication about a penalty but the penalty is not specified yes yeah, interesting um, so um, oh. so there's a way of um, conceptualizing um, a key, some would say the key moral concept, the concept of a requirement, as sort of a rule plus a penalty. That um, conception is, um, oh, I mean, you know, it's obviously at home in, um, in positive law, right? Um, so, I mean, so some people push that and what they suggest is that the way to understand morality is as um, issuing rules whose you know that have got to involve penalties in, of some kind but not the penalties that um, positive law gives you you know, you know imprisonment and so forth something else right um, in a suggestion people sometimes draw out from um, bits of uh, John Stuart Mill uh, you get the idea that the penalty is a matter of, um, you know, sort of social disapproval or something, right? Um, that's a possible view, right? Um, other moral philosophers, and I, I mean, I tend rather to, to this latter camp myself, actually, think that that way of sort of analyzing the key moral concept is... Um, isn't ultimately the one you should go with, in, in part because, um, oh, we talk about um, what sorts of things sort of ought to be penalized, and it's hard to understand what that could mean if ought it was just a matter of, you know, um, do this or, the, or there being a penalty. So um, the alternate view would have it that the sort of fundamental moral notion of Obligation or requirement is not analyzable in this way. I mean, so I think that's that's the way I tend. But I mean, it's an interesting interesting line of thought. And as I say, it, I mean, it's it's both has sort of um, a classical, you know, sources mill prominently, and you know, there are contemporary philosophers who run with versions of it. So yeah, interesting. So what else do people see or notice or want to pursue here? Yeah. I thought all these uh, questions related back to question one, when in fact society decides like what is right or what is wrong, and uh, some states have capital punishment like the death penalty, while others don't. So I thought maybe question one was really the important one. So question question one, that's the question: What's a just society, right? Um, so I can see two ways of pushing what you're suggesting there, right? So one way is you're just making a version of the point that was made over here a bit ago, that is the point that there's a kind of hierarchy and you're suggesting that the um, what is a just society question is the 
sort of central theoretical question in the hierarchy rather than the what makes right actions right question. So that would be one way of pushing it. The other way of pushing it would be this more relativistic sounding thing where what you're suggesting is that um, the, the, the answer to the question about um, what makes things right or what is just is just determined by what the society thinks, right? So that, I mean, that would be um, a distinct further move, a possible move, right? But that, that, that commits you to a specific view about, you know, what kind of moral objectivity there is and what it consists in, which you're not committed to just by thinking that a certain question is the sort of the central question, right? Good. Anything else people want to raise at this point? Hmm? All right. Well, so good. So, um, you know, a couple of things came up, right? So one is this sort of, you know, hierarchy thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn to that in just a sec. Um, the other is... Um, a number of interesting variants of these sort of relativistic views, these views according to which uh, morality is all a matter of opinion or it's all socially determined, right? And that's kind of the next, um, well, the next thing we explore after arguments, and it's the, it's the um, uh, sort of the first thing that we'll put our uh, philosophical tools to use in thinking about. Right? Good, okay. So if we can... Um, Go back to the PowerPoint briefly. So we, we got our um, list of ethical questions, and if I remember how these work, right? So, um, so here's a way of sort of conceptualizing the hierarchy. Okay. Um, so we've got um, we can go, you, can, you can write this thing down. But we've got the sort of four levels of ethical judgments. write down what's here and then I'll give you some commentary to explain these these categories in a minute. All right, so let me um, give you a little more commentary on the categories, and then um, I'll ask you, and we can see sort of which of the um, which of our list of six questions um, fits into um, each of these uh, category boxes. Right. So first off, then particular moral judgments. So these are judgments about the rightness, wrongness, goodness, badness, justice, injustice, etc., of a particular action on a particular occasion. So um, one of our questions directly involved or is answered by a judgment of this sort. Wh which one? The question about the $10. The ten question about the $10, yeah. No, number five, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's right. So, that, I mean, that's the, that's the one that falls into that category. Okay. Next category, then, category of judgments in applied ethics. So, there, what we're talking about is um, questions answered by judgments about. Um, the rightness, wrongness, goodness, badness, justice, injustice, etc., of um, kinds of action or um, specific sorts of um, social practices. Right? Um, as I take it, two of the questions that we had fall into that category. Wh which would those be? Two 
Two and six, yeah, yeah, that's right. So the, the um, capital punishment one and the euthanasia one. Yeah. Okay. Um, third category then. Judgments in ethical theory. So here what I have in mind are um, the most general answers to questions about what things are um, right, wrong, good, bad, just, unjust, etc. Right? Um, as I take it, two of the questions we have fall into this category. Well, this, this is a little harder, and you know, um, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what you come up with. But you know, the, the, what's hard is distinguishing it from the final category. Three and four. Three and four. No, four what? Four. One and four. Right. So the what makes society just? What makes right actions right? Um, What's hard about that, right, is distinguishing it from the final category. So let me um, give you an introductory version of that, um, what that final category involves, and then, um, you know, say something more by way of analogy about how to understand the difference there, right? So the idea with the final category, the judgments about ethics, is these are um, not judgments that um, you make while doing ethics. They're not sort of internal participant judgments. They're rather judgments that you make sort of from the outside looking in at the practice of doing ethics and asking what's going on. Right? You know, the various sort of metaphors you can try here. I'll try an analogy in a bit as well. But the metaphors like, you know, some of them you answer with your ethicist's hat on, but these judgments about ethics, once you questions about ethics, you answer with your ethicist's hat off. Or, you know, there are ones that are sort of part of the um, process of ethical thinking, others that involve sort of standing back from that process and asking what's going on. Right? Um, in order to clarify the distinction between that sort of question and all the others, in particular the third category, the judgments in ethical theory, um, it may help to consider an analogy where the distinction between the two may be clearer. So consider, by way of analogy, the case of mathematics. Right? So there are a whole bunch of questions in mathematics. Right? Um, you know, we could sort of distinguish them by levels of difficulty. Right? So there are you know, basic arithmetical questions. You know, what's 2 plus 3? Right? You know, corresponding judgments, 2 plus 3 is 5. Right? Um, then there are you know, sort of fairly tricky, but um, you know, for the sophisticated mathematician routine things like, you know, what's the solution to such and such a differential equation, right? And then there are, um, you know, really very tricky sort of frontiers of mathematics kind of stuff. You know, what's the proof of, or is there a proof of Fermat's last theorem, right? I mean, any sort of answer to that, very tricky. You've got to be a high-powered mathematician to know what you're doing with that. But um, all those are questions within mathematics. Right, they're all questions that you ask and answer, you know, using mathematical techniques, using mathematical tools. Right? Contrast them all, right, with the following question about mathematics: the question, are mathematical judgments true when they are true because they accurately describe the nature of mathematical reality, or are they true merely because of the way in which we've decided to use mathematical symbols? That's a different sort of question, right? That's a question about what's going on when people do mathematics. And it's not a question that you're going to, in any obvious way, answer by using standard mathematical techniques. It's a different sort of thing, right? It's a, um, it's a sort of outsider's question about what's going on when people do mathematics, not an insider's question that involves doing mathematics. So do you, so do you see the contrast in that case? So I mean, the, the, so the idea is right. It's sort of clearer in that case. But now, once once you've understood how the contrast works in the mathematical case, then sort of bring it back to the the ethical case, and hopefully it, it clarifies the distinction between category four and the other stuff, especially category three. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, so um, if we go back to the PowerPoint briefly again. Um, just uh, you know, a couple more things I want to um, 
say, using the PowerPoint or using these categories here, right? I mean, so one thing you might ask is, um, where is our main focus going to be in this course? And the answer is our main focus is going to be two and three, right? Um, we're going to do a little bit of the, you know, category four stuff. In fact, we're going to focus, you know, to begin with, as I've already said on uh, a previous PowerPoint list of ethical questions, question three, right? Um, the, the relativity question. We're not going to do much of the stuff that is in category four, though, and that's good because it's an introductory course and that stuff, the questions about ethics, judgments about ethics stuff, it gets pretty hard pretty quick. Right, because it, it involves bringing in analogies from other areas, and it tends to involve, you know, philosophy of science and philosophy of language. And believe me, it, get, it, it does. It gets gets hard quickly. So we won't do a lot of that. Right. Um, so we'll mainly be focused sort of category three, category two. Um, the other thing, though, cool. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, though, I mean, it's not as if these categories are kind of insulated, hermetically sealed from one another, right? Um, so. Um, Oh, the answer to questions about in, in one category is often determined by what you say in other categories. I mean, like this, right? I mean, suppose you think, how many of you know who Timothy McVeigh was? Most of you. One of the things that happens. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that happens if you've been teaching for a while. Then I have colleagues who, are, believe it or not, considerably older than me, and they um, they encounter this much more dramatically than I normally do. But you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff they remember that is sort of totally off the the radar screen of the younger generation. Right? Anyway, so if you don't know, Timothy McVeigh was the guy who bombed the Oklahoma City Federal Building in the... 1995. 1995, yeah. yeah. Um, so look, um, and he was executed, right? Um, so look, here's an inconsistent set of views. Capital punishment is never morally okay, but it was okay to execute Timothy McVeigh. Right? So another way to put the point there is, look, there's a case in which a particular moral judgment, namely the ju a judgment about um, the uh, rightness or not of executing a particular person, determines your view at w what we had as the level of judgments in applied ethics. I mean, it's inconsistent to hold that, you know, it, capital punishment is never morally okay, but it's okay in this case, right? In ways like that, what you think at one level, right, is going to... Um, Determine what you've got to think at other levels. So, so it's not as if the levels are, you know, hermetically sealed from one another. Um, what you think at one level is going to have implications for what you think at others. All right, good. Um, final thing I want to do then. Um, yes. Um, final thing I want to do is um, do a little bit more by way of a definition. Now, um, I should say that um, I think you've got to be modest here, right? Um, people sometimes have the view that um, insofar as there's controversy in ethics, that controversy is caused by um, a failure to give an adequate definition of the field. And if only we could give an adequate definition of ethics, then that would sort of solve all the outstanding issues. I don't think that's a sensible way to think myself, right? Um, for two reasons, right? I mean, first, it seems to me in other areas where we manage to make a bunch of progress, for instance, the one we were just thinking about mathematics, that progress doesn't seem in any obvious way to depend on our having a good definition of the field. A second is, look, I mean, insofar as there's controversy in ethics, right, I mean, my bet is if you can come up with a definition of ethics that, uh, oh, resolves these controversies, you know, the definition of ethics such that it just follows from this definition that, say, you know, abortion is wrong or utilitarianism is wholly mistaken or whatever, what's going to happen is, of course, that the people who think that abortion is okay or that utilitarianism is right are just going to reject the definition, right? So the idea that somehow, you know, a definition will be this, um, uh, sort of magic bullet that's going to, you know, force anyone who, you know, disagrees with you to um, lay down and give up seems to me, you know, a mistaken idea. Right? So, I if you're in the business of giving a definition, you've got to be pretty modest, right? You're not, 
in giving a definition of ethics, going to be able to say something that's going to um, solve all the problems straightforwardly up front. Right? All you're going to be able to do is give a little more of a sense of sort of key features that you know everyone or almost everyone who thinks about the field thinks that you know ethics or moral judgments have. Right? And that and that's the business. I do think it's sensible to do a little bit more of. So at this point, if we go to the, go to the PowerPoint, um, I want to suggest three features. And again, you can write down, write them down, and then I'll say more about them. Normativity, rationality, and impartiality there. Good. So yeah, if, if we go back to the, yeah. Um, so of these features, Rachel's in the first chapter of the Elements of Moral Philosophy talks about um, the latter two, rationality and impartiality. He doesn't talk about normativity. Um, I mean, I sort of, I think he should, but he doesn't. But I want to start with that one. Okay. So look, the idea of normativity is the idea that um, key central moral judgments are something different from factual judgments. They're not judgments about what's in fact the case, they're judgments about what ought to be the case. They're not, you know, the various bits of language you can use here roughly equivalently, they're not factual, they're evaluative or normative. So, um, I mean, you know, one a way of illustrating this, I mean, take a um, take a controversy. Take, I mean, take one of the ones we were just thinking about. Take the controversy over capital punishment. Right? Suppose someone thinks capital punishment is always wrong. Right? You do not show that that person's view is mistaken by telling them that some given number of people were executed in the United States last year. Right? Because again, their view is not capital punishment never happens. It's not. A, a view about that factual issue. It's rather the view that capital punishment is wrong, that it ought not to happen. It's a evaluative or normative claim or view, not a factual one. And there's something very standardly taken to follow from this distinction, right? That thing that's standardly taken to follow is that you can't properly infer or support um, a normative or a value of conclusion just on the basis of factual premises, right? To support a normative or a value of conclusion, you've got to have at least one evaluative premise. Okay, so is, is everyone, um, everyone okay on this notion, the, the concept of normativity here? But the idea, I mean, you know, it's about, as I say, it's about key central moral judgments. They're, they're not factual judgments. They're not about the facts. They're about something else, about how things ought to be. Right. All right, good. So um, the two other features, then, these are things that um, Rachel's does talk about. And I'll, I'll read you some of the bits in just a tick. Um, start with rationality. So here the business um, Rachel's is really in is the business of oh, distinguishing moral judgments from judgments of personal taste. And his thought is, look, um, it's, as he would tend to put it, it I mean, it's a logical feature of moral judgments that they stand in need of justification in a way that judgments of taste do not. So, um, he talks about this, this is um, Elements of Moral Philosophy, um, page 11, 
Um, start with the final sentence of the third paragraph. That doesn't apply today so much, but um, in general, right, you'll want to bring your books along, right? Those of you who are here in the studio, they, you know, they're not, I'm afraid, cheap, but they do have the advantage of being relatively light. Yeah. Okay, so so Rachel says that. Um, page 11, uh, final, starting with the final sentence, the third paragraph. The morally right thing to do is always the thing best supported by the arguments. This is not a narrow point about a small range of moral views. It is a general requirement of logic that must be accepted by everyone, regardless of their position on any particular issue. The fundamental point may be stated simply. Suppose someone says that you ought to do such and such. You may legitimately ask why you should do it, and if no good reason can be given, you may reject the advice as arbitrary or unfounded. In this way, moral judgments are different from expressions of personal taste. If someone says, I like coffee, she does not need to have a reason. She is merely stating a fact about herself and nothing more. There is no such thing as rationally defending one's like or dislike of coffee. So long as she is accurately reporting her taste, what she says must be true. On the other hand, if someone says that something is morally wrong, he does need reasons. And if his reasons are legitimate, then other people must acknowledge their force. By the same logic, if he has no good reason for what he says, he is simply making noise and we can ignore him. So, I mean, see the thought, right? Um, not an entirely uncontroversial thought because there are people who um, do in some way want to assimilate moral judgments to judgments of personal taste but a pretty uncontroversial thought I mean pretty much everyone who thinks about morality doesn't take that one right? so Rachel's thought is look a moral judgment unlike such a judgment of personal taste stands in need of justification I mean if you make a moral judgment you've got to be prepared to back it up you've got to be prepared to give the reasons for it Whereas, you know, if someone asks you why you like a certain flavor of ice cream or whatever, you say, I just do. And, you know, you, there is no um, similar need for you to provide any justification for that. Yeah. All right. Um, the third feature, then, impartiality, which, again, Rachel's talked about, is, I think, best thought of as um, a matter of the kind of reasons moral reasons are. Right? So, I mean, given what we just said, given what we said about rationality, um, moral judgments stand in need of justification. But then the, the, the further refinement, I take it here, is the thought that only certain sorts of justification sort of count as moral justifications. Right? In particular, um, Moral justifications need to be, in a certain sense, impartial, right? So, um, if we think back to the case about my borrowing the ten dollars from you, right? Um, if I say I ought not to pay you back the ten dollars because I'll be poorer if I do, right? I may have given some sort of reason not to pay back the ten dollars, but the thought here would be, I haven't given a moral reason. I haven't given a moral reason because I've only focused on me and my interest. I haven't focused on anyone else's, and so I've failed to be impartial. Similarly, suppose there's a controversy about the morality of affirmative action. Right? There are various reasons someone might give to, to take one side to oppose affirmative action, um, but only some of these are moral reasons. So suppose someone says they're opposed to affirmative action, and you say why, and they say, well, it's bad for white males like me. Right? The thought here again will be, well, that may be some kind of reason to be opposed to affirmative action, but it's not a moral reason. And again, it's not a moral reason because it's not in the appropriate way impartial. Right? It doesn't involve taking everyone's interest into account. It just involves taking into account the interests of a particular um, group to which you belong. By contrast, right, I mean, if someone was opposed to affirmative action, you said why, and they said, well, um, they think on the whole that affirmative action um, results in the promotion of unqualified people and thus um, uh, exacerbates the, um, uh, you know, racial differences it's supposed to cure, right? 
that might not might might or might not be a good reason, but that does sound like a moral reason, right? Because that sounds like a reason that is appropriately impartial, that does involve taking everyone's interest into account. Um, now, on some of these matters, I think I disagree, maybe to some extent, with Rachel. So. Um, I don't know if he disagrees about this, but look, um, on my way of seeing it, not all reasons are in this sense moral reasons, right? Um, I'm perf I, I mean, it seems to me there are legal reasons and there are reasons of etiquette and there are self-interested reasons. There are probably other categories as well, right? And um, these are different from moral reasons. I guess, I mean, I guess he, he says he agrees with that, actually, right? So. Um, uh, I mean, in that sense, moral reasons are only one category of reason, right? The other thing, though, seems to me is there's no guarantee that what there's morally the most reason to do is going to be what there's most reason to do, period. Right? It's perfectly possible that in some cases, you know, you may have most moral reason to do one thing, but most reason altogether to do something else. Maybe, you know, self-interested reasons powerfully t push you in one direction, moral reasons in another, and the self-interested reasons are weightier, right? So, I'm inclined to think you shouldn't suppose that what you have most reason to do is, you know, the morally right thing. And I th there are things that Rachel says sometimes that makes me th make me think that he does suppose that. Right? So, um, there we disagree. You'll see we disagree at a bunch of other points as we go along as well. Um, but I think that doesn't affect the the main issue he's talking about here. Right? So the I the idea of impartiality does seem to me to um, capture something that is. Um, plausibly, you know, the defining feature of moral reasons as against others, you know. Um, and you can say that while recognizing that moral reasons are only one category of reason, and saying that does not commit you to this thing, further thing that Rachel's probably does think, which is that moral reasons in some sense always outweigh other reasons. You needn't think that to think that impartiality is a st sort of uh, central characteristic of them. Okay, any, anyone have any questions about this stuff? All right. Well, good. So, so um, the next thing is to turn to these key concepts that we're going to need throughout the course. These concepts involved in assessing reasons for and against moral views, concepts of an argument and of validity and of soundness, and we'll um, we'll turn to those next time.